zack away, zack away, zack away. Oh, I see, you right, know? right. And then it's like, okay, now we can get into the conversation yeah. and be present. I'm a, I'm a fat boss. I'm a fat boss. I'm a, I'm a fat boss. Oh, David. Thank Hello. you for coming. Fallon, thanks for having me on. You are a professor at UFT for philosophy. That's right, yeah. Hopefully you can learned me something. <laughs> okay, I'll do my best, right. So what got you into philosophy? Oh, well, you know, really it was late in high school and I got my hands on a couple of philosophy books and, uh, you know, it was a, it was a subject that my teachers hadn't, hadn't ruined for me yet. You know, I always sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, kind of having a rebellious 17 year old attitude. Um, and so I got pretty into it, went off to college, uh, wanting to study philosophy. Were you a religious person? Oh, you, you know, growing up, family? I was growing up. I was, um, I mean, my family wasn't super religious, but I grew up in the, in the South in the U S. Uh, so central Florida oh, is, that's right. you were saying you're not Canadian. I'm not, that's right. I'm American. So I, so central, so the coastlines of Florida are like sort of, uh, you know, Miami and Tampa and all that, but the, the sort of North and the center part, it's pretty Southern. And so, yeah, there was sort of the whole evangelical world there. And I kind of grew up uh, around that. Uh, around that. And I mean, I grew up going to Sunday school and youth group and stuff like that. But I think it was by the time I was 13 or so, I was already 12, 13. I started, uh, I started having some doubts uh, about, uh, about it. And, uh, you know, by the time I got interested in philosophy late in high school, I was already an atheist. So. Okay. So it was the questioning God. Yeah. You know, I guess that was an early step, okay. right? Uh, and so yeah. along your way, you found that, that your beliefs more line up with atheism. Right. Yeah. Um, and, but, but really what got me into philosophy, so I don't really write about, uh, write about the existence of God or, or, uh, much, um, I got really interested in uh, mind-body dualism, just the relationship between our conscious minds and the physical world. Um, because on the one hand, it seems like we have a whole lot of scientific evidence telling us that um, you know we're physical beings, we have physical brains, our mental lives are in some sense realized by acti physical activity in our brains. But on the other hand, it's kind of an astonishing thing. It's really hard to make sense of. Like, how could, when I look at this chair and it's the color red, the experience of red, the way red looks to me, um, that's some brain state. Like my experience of red is some state of electrical activity inside my brain when I have a thought. Right, or when if I, I hear something. When I hear something, electrical... when I think when I think about abstract subjects, yeah. when I, well, there's a physical, yeah. there's a physical part. And this is something that I don't, I, I can't agree with, um, with an atheist mm. is because there's this physical right. aspect to it, which we still know very little about mm -hmm. our physical body, but then there's this element that connects it that we know nothing about. I see. There's a there's something else happening. I don't know if spirit or whatever you right, right. want to call it, but there's something there, and that thing can also change. So uh, it's, the view you're describing sounds like what I was calling dualism. Uh, just just because it says there's two things, right? right? There's yeah. the mind and the body, and those are two different things. And there's some kind of, uh, so for example, the philosopher uh, Rene Descartes is like a famous dualist in the history of philosophy. Um, uh, also, if you remember Cartesian coordinates from high school math class, that was no. him as well. Okay. Well, you, where you have to graph an equation, like draw a line or uh, anyway. Okay, I have a GED. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, was, uh, I bet you did it, it, it anyway. But, um, but it, one of the things he's known for in the history of philosophy is, uh, is mind body dualism is a, a claim that our minds are immaterial things that merely interact with our physical bodies, uh, in the brain. Uh, so the interaction action takes place in the brain on his view. Oh, I've been, sorry, yeah, go ahead. but I've been, go ahead. um, 
I'm doing a lot of reading of gut health oh, and the connection uh-huh. between the gut right. and the brain right, right. and how it, how it can determine our mood, um, even how we function. And perhaps that can affect what we think we identify mm-hmm. with or what we think our opinions are. Yeah. And the fact that that can change and our brain can also change. Right. Well, according look, to our thoughts. Yeah. I mean, look, this is one example of the kind of evidence that to me as a materialist, someone who thinks that, uh, who denies dualism and says ultimately reality is physical or material. Um, this is one source of evidence that leads me to reject dualism is, is uh, the uh, extent to which we already understand the way our brain states and uh, to the extent that they're influenced by our bodily states um, affect our, our thinking and our consciousness. And, um, you know, if you, uh, well, just to elaborate the point a little bit, I mean, um, people can have brain damage due to lots of different issues, you know, like strokes, right. for example. If you have a stroke, it can it can make sort of focal damage to one part of the brain. It can have all kinds of very particular impairments, like an inability to recognize faces, an inability to produce speech, um, leaving other things intact. Um, you know. Uh, so could and, that not yeah. be a disconnect from? So is that is that how you are are disconnecting the dualism is because if you can have brain damage yeah. and that can affect your right. soul or your consciousness mm-hmm. um then is there some is there something bigger right exactly so like you know even descartes who i was mentioning before he understood that the brain had a really important role in our mental lives he just thought that wasn't all there was to it So I think he would have recognized that, say, he he thought he understood that memory, for example, was stored in in in, in the brain. And now we have a better idea, somewhat better idea of how it works, what brain regions are involved. If you have damage to those brain regions or just deterioration due, for example, to Alzheimer's disease. So my understanding is pretty limited of the mechanics of how Alzheimer's disease works. As I understand it, it's still not totally known, but it involves the buildup of plaques on neurons that keeps them from functioning. And then eventually they die. Like extra proteins or not enough proteins? Um, so Something to do with protein. I fr- the, the, yeah, the plaques are made out of amyloid beta or amyloid B proteins. I, okay. This is beyond my my knowledge base here, but uh, but yeah, they 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 it's at least associated with Alzheimer's disease, it, and and I think it's believed to be the major drivers. Like these plaques build up on the neurons, they can't function anymore, and eventually. Uh, eventually they die. But where does that consciousness go? Exactly. So Descartes thought that there was a little bit left over that could not be explained by the physical processes of the brain. He he thought it was abstract reasoning abilities. Um, But uh, it's a, you know, first approximation. And, but I, but to me, I think there's just enough evidence from, um, from, you know, what happens, for example, in uh, very commonly in old age, people have degenerative, uh, conditions with their brains, like Alzheimer's disease and their mind just goes, and there's just so kind of nothing lack left of over. Connect, yeah. So does that lack of connect therefore mean that there isn't uh, something that is bigger that is connecting all of us? Hmm. I mean, that's at a level of abstraction where I wonder if maybe there could be, I mean, I do think it's evidence, it's not decisive proof, but it's evidence that there's not some additional immaterial element um, involved in uh, our mental lives. Uh, Because as the brain deteriorates, more and more of the consciousness (laughs) deteriorates with it. And there's really nothing, what about, there's okay. nothing that holds, sticks around and is still perfect in someone who's at the, in the end stages but of does, dementia. But do you have to be perfect for there to still be a consciousness? Right. And no. the, the fact that our brains deteriorate, mm-hmm. so this is, mm-hmm. this is one of my view or that I've been sure. exploring yeah, yeah. right now is uh-huh. we're transient beings mm-hmm. and our opinions and our thoughts are constantly changing. Mm-hmm. And our, our brains can change. Right. 
can, is there parts of our brains that we just cannot tap into that we cannot mm-hmm. um, understand just because of where we are as a human species and where our right. brain is developed where you have these people including myself that play with psychedelics another great example of the effect of physical changes to brain activity affecting your consciousness is drug use right so um um, oh yeah, I've been smoking way too much weed, uh-huh. and I've been listening to um, oh, Huberman, Huberman, something. Uh, he had he had this podcast Huberman. on dopamine levels. Oh okay. And I think that my dopamine levels have gone way down uh-huh. due to you think so i think so uh-huh. yeah because of uh-huh. lack of motivation oh, okay uh-huh. nothing seems really exciting oh i see i see so that in itself is another example of how our hormones right if they're imbalanced um they are they're, they're like they're a catalyst for how we behave in the outside world uh-huh Right. So look, I think anybody, dualist or materialist, is just going to have to, there's so much evidence that our brains are like heavily involved in our consciousness. And so then- And our gut. And our gut. Well, but look- You can't forget about the gut. The gut, the gut, it may just be the gut affects the brain. And so the brain is affecting consciousness, right? The gut's just indirectly. But I mean, I, I don't know. We've got nerves in our guts too, but I kind of doubt I kind of doubt that our consciousness is like directly affected by the gut as opposed to the gut affecting the brain. I just, I've, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, look, I mean, the question is whether there there is is some phenomenon. But there is a connection between people who are depressed and eat eat shit food. Oh, sure. Oh, for sure. Right. Well, of course. But then there's a question of how does that affect your, uh, how does that affect your depression? And it may do it, 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 I think probably the likeliest explanation is going to be because it affects your brain, right? Your brain is where the, is the, that's the, that's the center of consciousness right. in your body, right? It's not in your heart. It's not in your kneecap. It's in. Well, we right? always go to um, the brain, but, the third but every, eye, but, yeah. everything is into the brain. Right. Right. But anyway, um, you know, the, the question is whether there is sort of any, as I think you were pointing out, any kind of residual, uh, you know, residuum left over when you subtract out all of the all of the the role that the brain plays. Is there something? Is there something left that just can't be explained in physical terms? Mm-hmm. And it's not just like seventeenth philosophers, you know, seventeenth or seventeenth century philosophers who thought who thought so. Like you know, there's contemporary philosophers uh, like uh, David Chalmers is an example who thinks that like you, that. You know, the appearance, uh, I I was saying before, it's really astonishing to me that my conscious experiences could just be states of my brain. Why would some brain activity over here explain why things look and sound and smell to me like they do? Why why that way and not some other way? Right. And so he thinks the the appearance of... um, you know, a gap between the the physical phenomena in your brain and uh, your consciousness represents a kind of real gap in nature. And there really is this sort of phenomenal uh, um, um, sort of residual element that can't be explained in terms of uh, in terms of brain states. So there is a connection, but it's a gap due to our lack of knowledge. Well, so that's what I'm inclined to think, right? That, you know, well, I don't understand. There would have to be a connection. Yeah, it, would be, yeah. it would make absolutely no sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look. Um, Even, I, uh-huh. like, we Go find ahead. ourselves talking about nature and going into nature and hanging, mm-hmm. camping and hanging out in nature, yeah. but we've, we've completely disassociated ourselves with the fact that we are nature. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And I think that is pulling people further and further away of looking at reality. 
Well, I don't know. Um, um, so as a materialist, in a way, I feel like I'm, I'm more on the side of us being continuous with the rest of nature, right? Um, I mean, look, maybe... What do you mean by continuous with the rest of nature? Well, look, everything else in nature is made out of atoms. <laughs> and right? I think I'm made out of atoms and that's it. Right. But right? that's how I mean uh -huh. that there is still a connection. Uh -huh. It's not uh -huh. as though you are we are created from something completely not from this world. We right. are connected in some form, we all die. Yeah. So you don't, so when you say that you're, you know, you were expressing some sympathy for dualism, some dualists, not Chalmers I was mentioning, but Descartes, uh, you know, part of why, maybe part of the appeal of dualism is that it gives us some hope of an afterlife, of immortality. Well, see, right now I'm just more doing you know, questioning. I see, I and see. And I'm, I'm questioning if there is, I, I just, all I know is that, all I know is that I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and that, and I don't know what happens afterwards. And I also know enough to know that I don't know anything. Uh huh. And I don't know if myself or us as a human species knows enough mm -hmm. to say for certain. Right. Well, look, the demand for certainty, like that's a high well, bar, it's been. right? Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, even the desire in, in man to, sorry, people, people are going to fucking like, uh, <laughs> in people, um, to, to create and to, to explore is, right. Why is that there? Right. It's an amazing thing, right? Because um, if I don't so create, many, I get depressed. Yeah, yeah. With so many traits in human beings, right? It's, it's sort of easy, even if the details are hard to know, it's sort of easy to look at, well, why we as a products of evolution by natural selection, why we get hungry, you know, right. why, why do we have well, some of our basic drives? there's a place in the drives. back of, yeah. of here right. that actually, because well, we are all yes. we're basically tubes. So in the back of our neck here, there's a, a tube. And when our stomach releases certain gases, this closes and mm -hmm. tightens and sends a signal to our brain saying, we need to, we need food. I just mean not in terms of the mechanism. No, I know, but I'm right. sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Right. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, but not, but not in terms of the mechanism. How just, just how did it come about? Why do we have these drives and yeah, inclinations why? and characteristics? With a lot of it, it's like okay, well, we have vision to see things in our environment. We have hunger and thirst to get us to eat and drink. But then there are these really distinctively, and we share a lot of that stuff with other other animals. And uh, but there are these kind of amazing traits that we, you know curiosity. Actually, but actually, I kind of think curiosity. yeah, yeah. I, I was about and to say I so. Yeah, I also think yeah, I that think so. we as a right. as a species are too fucking um, narcissistic oh, to uh -huh. think that an, an animal could have a consciousness. I see. I mean, I think animals are conscious. I don't know which ones, but I think right. at I least a lot of the mammals are. I don't know how they communicate, are, right? right? They could, right. like, whales could communicate telepathically, but it's beyond <laughs> yeah. our grasp right. to know it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I do I do think that human beings uh, have a kind of sophisticated system for communication that isn't, well, definitely. isn't, is isn't around in, in and other... And is very distinct yeah, from all yeah, the other animals. Yeah, very distinct. But, but I agree. Actually, I agree about the curiosity part. I, I, I'm curious. What, you, what makes you say that animals are, are curious? I, I feel like uh, I've... Well, they would have to be curious. Uh-huh. Yeah. In order to survive. I see. Right. I mean, I've seen it in like dogs, for example, really seem like they have a state of investigating. Yeah. And they seem excited when and they're emotion too. Right. Oh sure. With a lot of with a lot they of human emotions. Sad. Yes, that's they right. Can, that's right. I mean, look at elephants. They they cry, they right. go back to Do the they? place where their loved one died yeah. uh -huh. and they have a memorial uh -huh. for them. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I mean, definitely with a lot of the basic human emotions, you can see it. If not, if we don't want to call it anger and sadness, it's at least something that is related to anger and sadness in other in other mammals. 
right? It's it's pretty it's pretty. But I cool. can't imagine a dog um, walking around not having a conscious. I I don't I don't I just, yes I don't. You know that Dec I keep mentioning Descartes. He he had this utterly uh, astonishing view that only human beings um, have consciousness. Um, and uh, and here's here's the argument, right? The argument is, well, we know the brain can do all of this stuff without any role from an immaterial mind. Uh, what is it that can't be done by the brain alone? Well, it's it's like language and abstract reasoning. It's stuff that only human beings have. He thought, and so he thought only the only uh the only animals but with consciousness gorillas and chimps yeah. they have reasoning and uh -huh. they have uh -huh. abstract reasoning right i don't know what i don't know what descartes knew about chimps and gorillas it was you know the early 17th century <laughs> okay. so but yeah <laughs> again right, see right, it's right, our right, ignorance yes, right we course. say that something is something right, but right, we don't know right. i just feel that we as, i don't accept we that don't argument. know I don't accept that argument because I think, uh, you know, um, I, I, yeah, anyway. Uh, so this is part of what I was thinking when I say, in a way, the materialist says we're more continuous with the rest of nature because it's not like there's only certain bits of nature that have this special extra consciousness added to it. Um, nothing has the special extra consciousness added to it. We're all fundamentally made of the same you know, few types of particles operating according to the same few basic laws. And uh, the only thing that uh, is different about us is how they're arranged and put together. Um, and uh, so in a way, I, I think the I mean, I don't know if this is the kind of continuity with nature that you wanted, but it is a way that, uh, according to materialism, uh, you know, we have a lot, a lot more in common with nature than the dualist might have thought. I mean, some dualists think Consciousness is everywhere. Uh, you know, a dualist thinks that there's something about consciousness that can't be explained in purely physical or material terms. Okay. So there's got to be something else. And so, but that leaves a lot open. What's the something else and how is it connected to yeah. the material world? So, you know, there's like Descartes had this view that each one of us, in addition to our physical bodies, had an immaterial mind. And that had some you know, that, that was responsible for abstract reasoning and the sort of higher mm -hmm. cognitive functions. And anywhere in nature that you look that, where, that doesn't have that, there's no mind there. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, well, th so there, look, I think- Because a, I look more... at plants and even plants to me uh -huh. have, have a mind. Well, you, look, there's some dualists think, think so as well. Um, and, you know, they think that consciousness is some kind of ubiquitous phenomenon that somehow related to every physical activity. Like there's sort of two sides to the world that run in, run mm. in parallel to each other. Um, that view is sometimes called panpsychism. Pan means everything. Right. Psychism, Isn't obviously. Everybody, Everything's got everything a mind. Is everything, pan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything is pan. Uh, everything has a psychic, a psychical side, a, a mental side to it. But, uh, but uh, maybe it's a pretty you have astonishing to view. Into it. You said plants. Do you think this table has? Well, see, this is the thing. Okay, yeah. I, I I talked about this in one of my other podcasts. Where back to that frequency thing. Yeah. What if? Okay, so if we all vibrate at a certain frequency, mm -hmm. and if we can tune into that frequency to get to, to live the life that we want, what if we were able to tune into the free, resonant frequency of this table within ourselves? Could we then be that table? <laughs> Maybe I'm old fashioned. Because here, even Tom. down yeah, to uh -huh. our 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 um atoms, they're vibrating at a certain frequency. Mm -hmm. That frequency within ourselves to make up ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if I was able to do that with the with this and find out what the atoms in here are, what their frequency is. There, could I be that then? I don't know what the consciousness of a table would be like if it had consciousness. I kind of expect it to not be very, very sophisticated. I mean, I, you know, it seems like the rich conscious lives that we have um, with. Well, I guess it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. need anything. Because mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of the difference between a table and a plant. A plant needs needs things. It needs water. Mm -hmm. It needs sunlight. Mm -hmm. It needs food. Mm -hmm. The table doesn't need anything. So you th you you think plants have some kind of some kind of conscious experience? Is that? Um, 
I do. I think yeah. that they can they can feel us, and I think that w- perhaps this is just an idea that perhaps again because we are running at a certain frequency that we block a certain part of our brain where we can't hmm. we can't feel the presence of a plant i see can i ask you just you were saying that you've been you know doing a lot of questioning right uh, mm-hmm. i what, what you you asked me how did i get started can i ask you how did you how did you get started with oh um I think around I was 13 uh-huh. and I got into Buddhism ah, uh-huh. and uh, yoga. My mom did a lot of yoga uh-huh. and uh-huh. then I just started questioning things. And then also I, I my mom was an atheist mm-hmm. and she constantly put down the Bible mm-hmm. and I found myself doing the same thing. And I thought, I've never read this book. Uh huh. Uh-huh. I've never read it, and I here I am. Yeah. Just talking shit about it. <laughs> so I read it. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it took me a long time to read it. Yeah, they say you can yeah. read it in three days. Uh, no. The Bible in three days. <laughs> yeah. Who re- who could read the they Bible say you in, can three read days. It in three days? No way. Um, but to fully understand it, I don't know. It took me a few years. And then I read the Quran. Uh huh. And the Torah, which is the first test. The Old Testament, right? Um, yeah, I just and it's. I found what I found fascinating was uh-huh. the similarities in everything. I see. I see. So you have a you you can you said you're not an atheist. You consider yourself maybe a religious believer, but not a sort of non denominational. Is that is that? I feel that there is something bigger than me that I don't understand. Mm-hmm. And I would like to, I know that before in my lifetime, I probably yeah. won't understand, but I would like to understand as much as I can before I die. I'm a, I'm a fat boss. I'm a fat boss. I'm a, I'm a fat boss.